I'm McKinney Smith. After going through a divorce, my sister passing away, experiencing narcissistic abuse, and some significant health scares, I realized through sharing my story that I wasn't alone in my suffering. Suffering, subjective distress generated by the experience of being out of balance. In a deep dive to holistically heal mind, body, and soul is where I discovered peace, clarity, and connection. It is impossible to be truly wise without some real-life hardship, and we cannot develop post-traumatic wisdom without making it through, and most importantly, through it together. Social connection builds resilience, and resilience helps create post-traumatic wisdom, and that wisdom leads to hope. Hope for you and others witnessing and participating in your healing, and hope for your community. A healthy community is a healing community, and a healing community is full of hope because it has seen its own people weather, survive, and thrive. Thank you for joining us on the Heal Her podcast, H-E-A-L, Honor, Elevate, and Love Her podcast, formerly known as the Iwaka My Stilettos podcast the top 1.5% most popular show globally where we have conversations with extraordinary women on their journey toward wholeness and harmony. And since you're already here, you may as well subscribe. As a certified mindset coach guiding women towards peace, clarity, and connection within, supporting the direction of the system toward wholeness, my goal here is to help you thrive. Meryl Kiesman is a wealth muse, business mentor, and women's wealth advocate dedicated to helping you become the wealthiest woman in your lineage. A former cleaning lady turned self-made millionaire matriarch, she believes that the most powerful thing we can do for our children is become unapologetic female leaders who fearlessly demand what they are worth and get it. Her insights, based on helping Over a thousand women stepping into self-funded wealth have been featured on CBS News, ABC News, publications like Forbes, Fast Company, Entrepreneur, and much more. So please welcome to the show, Meryl Kiegsman. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for agreeing to come on and share your truth with us to give the listeners a little bit of a, a backstory. We were recently on a panel together, the Anti-Hustle Manifesto, and all of the speakers were very transparent, but I loved, loved, loved everything that you had to say and fully connected with your, I'm going to say, directness. Um <laughs> It resonated with me because I'm also very blunt and not very good at sugarcoating. It's <laughs> got time for that, right? Yeah. It's like, oh, it takes too long to sugarcoat stuff sometimes. Oh, let's just go there. Yeah. <laughs> so I just had to have you on so that you could share some of that with the listeners today. So thank you for saying yes. <laughs> I'm so happy to have this conversation with you because I think it's it's really important and and, you know, I think we share this too, is this feeling of, wait, you're going to ask me to be on a panel about anti-hustle and right. Like even, even us like voices who are sort of known in our spaces, who are literally singled out, right. To be on a panel like that, there's still, I think like, like traces and patterns and, and, and things in, in our lives and in our routines that are, that are very hustle based. If not the things that we do, it's an undercurrent of how we still feel about our lived experience, right? That is is very sort of driven, externally driven. Yes, absolutely. It's our, you know, our paradigms and and the conditioning that we've been given about, you know, how we should work or how we should function. You know, when I was reading up on, on some of your, your backstory, you know, you mentioned, you know, your mother and your grandmother, so yeah. I'm going to break my own rules a little bit because, you know, I don't like rules, but uh, <laughs> um, so I want to jump right in and start there and and talk about like what you learned about money from your mother and your grandmother growing up. Well, you know, like always, it's a myriad of like, you know, tangled up all kinds of things, it's a, like, a, like a cauldron of all kinds of things. And I always just want to start by saying I come from a lineage of very strong women, like we're definitely 
I come from a matriarchy. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and wonderful things that I learned about from my mom, uh, for example, around self-confidence, my mom would walk into any room or any conversation and say, I have a great idea. (laughs) Right. So not, not even like just proposing something and then asking, you know, like crowdsource, like, is this a good idea? No, she comes in, she just knows it's a great idea. Uh, It's very interesting because my daughters don't speak Dutch. Just, you know, I'm from Holland originally. And, um, and they don't spend a lot of time with their grandma, but in English, they also, they just walk into any room and they say, I have a great idea. <laughs> in English, not, not in Dutch, right? So it's like beautiful how some of those very positive patterns have also been passed on. And I always want to preface with that because, you know, when we, when I talk at least for, for myself and, and, you know, the women in my family and my mother and my grandmother and their relationship to money. Um, it's a bit of a sad story, right. you know, it's, it's a bit of a sad story. I would say that maybe there will be a happy ending. Like my mom is at this point, like, like starting to flourish in her entrepreneurship. Mm-hmm. But as I was growing up, the things that I witnessed was, you know, my mom wanting to, buy something beautiful for herself, like some clothing, for example, and then having like her secret drawer that she always put like baggies into, right? Like the newly purchased um, beautiful things. And then she would just like drip it out over the course of months, right? In the hope that my dad wouldn't notice that she had spent some money on herself because it he was the sole provider financially and she was a homemaker. And so there was this this constant undercurrent of resentment around her inability to to turn talent into money, not being able to monetize her extraordinary gifts. Like mm-hmm. she is an interior designer and like she's into fashion and right. And just seeing her struggle with sort of like this chasm between everything that she was capable of being so deeply talented and ambitious Mm -hmm. and somehow not being able to, to translate that into a business that would, you know, be able to take the pressure off of my dad uh, for her to right. Have her own like career life. Uh, That was, that was very um, distressing, right. To see, um, in, in my case, like a mother and also a grandmother, just walk around with this, this deep ache of unfulfilled potential is yeah. how I would describe it. Yeah. Right. So it goes much deeper than just money, right? Like money is so connected to who we are in the world and whether we are recognized, right. Mm-hmm. For what it is that we offer and contribute. Mm-hmm. Um, so there was just this tremendous mismatch between potential and, and the financial reality of that. And, um, you know, I often would find my mom like crying in the backyard. Like she, she would smoke mm-hmm. with a cigarette, like in the, you know, my, I grew up with like wood stoves. So there were always like sheds with like lots of like wood stacked. And then I would find her and she would be smoking her cigarette and having her cup of coffee. And, and she'd be, she'd be crying, you know, she'd be so sad because she felt underappreciated. Mm. for everything that she contributed that maybe wasn't monetary and then it was always this question like why aren't you contributing monetarily right and then she was thinking about like she would discuss with my dad that maybe she would go back to nursing which she had done as a as a as a young woman it's like why Mm -hmm. (laughs) why would you do that when you you know you you've successfully renovated multiple homes back to right their 1900 like glory and basically everybody is asking you for advice all the time whether it's on your skin routine or what it is that you're wearing or how you're using shawls in your hair or what paint you use and what brands you it's like you know she would would have been like the perfect influencer influencer, yeah (laughs) like absolutely just born you know like 40 years early (laughs) um but it it's just like I didn't understand. Like I couldn't compute that reality of how I saw my mom and how she was struggling. Right. right. And I think that's that was sort of like the biggest message that I that I walked away with is um right. And also just noticing that the moment I did walk away, as in like I started my own life and I moved out, was that I was just like her. You know, my family's very artistic. It's like a family of of artists and psychics and mediums and astrologers and deep thinkers um 
So I was totally expected to have a artistic profession, right? Where most families are like, of course, you're going to be an accountant. Yeah. My family, like, of course, you're going to be like an illustrator or an opera singer, right? Like, you know, that's, those are your two options. Yeah. And so I, I went to opera school. I studied opera singing, loved it, had wonderful career successes, financial disaster, um, <laughs> You know, and, and just found myself at one point, like very, very, very pregnant, um, riding around on my bike, cleaning homes for wow. right five bucks an hour or so um, off of like, you know, whatever the German Kijiji, German version of Kijiji, whatever that is, or Craigslist, uh, I would get jobs. And, and again, I was like, why, why, why do I find myself in this position where I'm about to right pass on a whole lot of myself right willingly or unwillingly right becoming a mom and I'm I'm asking myself the same question that I basically asked my mom like well why 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 do I find myself destitute like in debt living far below the poverty level when I'm this fucking (laughs) like what's wrong (laughs) Uh, because I had that self-confidence right so chasm was felt between my self-confidence and my financial reality, there was this chasm. So I set out to to close it. I was like, if not for my own sake, then for the sake of my daughter, right? And now daughters, I want to I want to show them a different story. Right. And um and, and so that's really what sparked the whole journey. It's just like my own ferocious and dedicated and devoted learning of everything entrepreneurship and sales and marketing and wealth and just wanting a different story. Yeah. Like there's so much that you said there that I, that I want to unpack um, even how you just ended that just wanting a different story, because, you know, a lot of us have these origin stories and not necessarily rags to riches, but it's like, you know, how we grew up or the environment that we grew up in with lack and in survival mode and how we, whatever aha moment that was for us that shifted, that said, you know what? No, I'm going to change the legacy of my family. I don't want to be a part of this. I want to break these generational chains and curses and all these things. And I want different for the next generation. So yeah, I want to talk about value because not only just as women, but also as moms, because you're teaching other women to be the wealthiest in their lineage. And then you're also sharing the story of as a mom, the struggle of when you're a stay at home mom and you have all of this potential inside of you, but because you're not the one bringing in the income, how that affects our self-esteem and our value. And I've been there because I did that for five years. (laughs) So I I totally understand. So I, I, I would love if you could speak to some of that in terms of like how we as women place our our value in like the con I guess the financial contribution and then the struggle with when you are a stay-at-home mom not bringing in that financial like there are so many things that have value aside from money so let's let's get into that right and you see these tiktoks where uh, these stay-at-home moms actually said well if you had to pay for daycare and if you had to pay for somebody to do right your grocery shopping and actually yep. like saving your seven thousand you know dollars a month yeah. by being a mom, right so it's more like a now we don't have to pay for something rather than right physically bringing in uh money yeah um and that this is always the argument that my my mom has as well right like she took care of the kids and she did the cooking and she did the cleaning and she did the what do you say that sort of like social secretary stuff right like all those things and my family consists out of like multiple special needs kids right my my siblings and at one point um i went through anorexia in my teens and and right so there was like always it wasn't just stay at home mom it was like stay at home nurse mental health specialist uh, keeping reading about like diets and how she could change things to right sort of help us uh, stabilize our our internal states and uh, like everything so it was it was really a lot what I would say is that it's really a figuring out between like if you're partnered right let's say that that is your reality then it's about figuring out how you want to do that as a couple right for the last seven years, it was basically, well, you know, you're so good at this. This is so successful. It doesn't make sense, right? For in this case, my husband 
to go and start something of his own when I can so use his help right in all these ways in the business right as a, yeah. as a CFO doing a whole bunch of other stuff as well just being my support person because business is hard yeah. <laughs> so that, um, big decisions that need to be made um and also like you know um, um the other day I was cooking dinner and uh, my daughters were like, mama, this is delicious. We didn't even know you could cook. <laughs> <laughs> right. Which is like in your face, sort of like describe their reality, right. Of the last years, we didn't even know you could cook. This is <laughs> and, and this is probably like my own baggage. Right. But I started to feel as, as almost like this glorified, like cash cow, as in like, we, we need to milk this for all it's worth. Mm-hmm. And I think this is on the panel too, because you're so capable. Yeah. You're you're like a price cow, right? There's such an abundance of milk. This is awesome. There's overflow all around, right? And even where, like, whenever I received support, it felt like you know the way that you would groom your price cow to go and be presented, or to make sure that it has everything to keep on producing this mm-hmm. abundance of milk, right? Or or overflow. I mean, it's a it's a bit of a metaphor, but. Um, like, so, so it didn't feel like it was for me. It felt like self-care and support, all those things, even inspiration was there to make sure that I could maintain, right. Like delivering. Yeah. And that's why I'm, I'm like right now in this radical moment in my business where I'm actually like unplugging for a while Yeah. to, to truly feel what it feels like to take care of myself right and and I shared this as well right I've been struggling with insomnia for well I had a baby so like basically 10 days before the world shut down I had a baby I had our third dog and so I'm making my my village away from my original right home as in like Europe right now I'm in Canada and then even that that new sort of makeshift village right that I was building fell away so I was I was without like I wasn't surrounded by any people. I was alone, right? My thoughts got really dark. Like I started yeah. struggling with passive suicidal ideation. On top of that, there were a lot of shifts happening in the world around all of a sudden leaders being held to a much like fiercer standard, mm-hmm. which, you know, all great developments, but I was like scrambling to all of a sudden be that person that people wanted me to be sometimes successfully. So, and sometimes very unsuccessfully. So, Right. So that mix of postpartum cancellation and right, right. Like the pandemic, the loneliness, it got me to a place where I was really struggling mentally. Mm -hmm. And, and I, some days I still am. Um, Mm -hmm. I struggle a lot with anxiety and, um, just really feel that my nervous system has been knocked out of whack, like significant. And then for the last years, it was always like, how can I heal this while I still? keep going (laughs) you know swimming in the air and so yeah like after long long conversations like also like with my husband and and with my therapist I've decided to know I'm going to actually step away and I'm going to literally see the effect of that the impact of that like like business-wise but I need to love myself and heal myself unconditionally and sometimes that is what it looks like to be an a player in business yeah yeah I love that for you. I love that you have put you first and stepped away. Like sometimes people are like, oh, well, I can't step away from my business. We're making so much money right now. That's what I said for years, right? It's like, like, you know, forge the iron while it's hot, like all those things, right? And But at one point that runs out, as in that becomes like a very um, empty sort of, yeah, like not a loving thing to do for yourself, right? Yeah. Uh, again, like that cash cow thing. It's like, well, right now, right? There's, there's like all this overflow and abundance. So we better keep it coming, which essentially, right, is a lack of trust. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Essentially, okay. that's saying, well, right now is the season and it might never be this good again. Yeah. And I had to, and, and this is quite frankly, right? This is where this goes far beyond mental health, far beyond self care. This is a spiritual question. Yeah. I got so disillusioned in my own faith, 
around the pandemic because I I was I was becoming really very very aware of right also the climate crisis and and sort of like what world have I right birth these beautiful children into mm-hmm. just like the sheer heartbreak of everything that's unfolding around us at, at a more and more rapid pace I didn't know if there was uh, a loving force out there a loving God a loving divine presence mm-hmm. after a lifetime of of always feeling feeling very very strongly that yes there is um, and and I think honestly it's that losing that spiritual connection that actually made things so so hard for me because I started operating from a place of, right? Well, we better we better keep this going because it's good uh, for as long as it lasts. And instead of understanding that I am in a co-creative process, yeah, with the divine. And so for for me, like the last months have really been around just being on my knees, like surrendering right? Like handing it over, handing it over. And I know that that is how, you know, I'm going to find whatever next chapter, right? There is for me. Yeah. Um, And I'm not standing in the way of that anymore, because that's how it started to feel. Yeah, we we tend to block our own blessings, we tend to get in our own way and create our own limitations. There's so much of what you said that I love that I want to unpack. I guess I'll start with like, isolation you know, because yeah. you were very open about how that made you feel and suicidal ideation and all of those things. And le- okay, so at the end of the day, we're wired for connection. Yeah. And I think with the pandemic, the, uh, what is the word, you know, them forcing everyone to isolate and quarantine. And yeah, I understand from a, a health perspective, certain things, but I think the level that things were done, not only did it affect people's mental health, but it definitely affected their spirituality. Like you said, you know, it put you in that place of not having faith and living in a place of anxiety and fear. And that's all spiritually related. And it's like, we are living in a time where everyone now, whether you, whether you want to call it spirit, vibration, energy, it's all the same thing. It, it basically got completely disrupted because we're wired to connect. We are wired for community and to you know, be around each other. And then we were all forced to isolate. And now everyone is like freaking out. And there's this whole global anxiety of how, how, not only how do we survive and provide for our families, but how do we contribute to this world? How do we, you know, for our children that are in this world, there was so much uncertainty. And so faith and fear are both beliefs in the unknown. And at the end of the day, we have to just choose right? It's, it takes the same amount of energy for us to live in fear. And it's like, it's easier said than done to say, to just trust, tr- trust the process, trust God, trust spirit, trust all those things. It's easier to say, but once, like you said, you release and you surrender and you let go and you see things still happen and you see the blessings still come and you see that despite all of these things, you know, there's, there's good within that. It's, it's beautiful to experience and it's beautiful to witness other people share that experience as well, where you're like, oh, okay, it's not just me. Oh, I'm not crazy. Um, And and another thing that you said was, um, you know, when you talked about co-creation and again, this is how I knew that we were totally resonating on the same vibration because I use that term very often. And I say like every experience is co-created. Right now, you and I are co-creating an experience for the listeners. Like we co-create our life with God. Like everything is a co-creation. So my my spirit just lit up when you said that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, and, and it's um it, like when you focus on it, it becomes such a tangible feeling, Makini, don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. You literally feel that way. There is like a conversation happening yeah. here. There is like yeah. a response. I'm starting to see the signs, right? Um, yeah. I I was like getting to place like where, like I said, right? Like it's, it's like, I could keep going. Right. But it felt like I was swimming upstream. Right. Mm-hmm. I, was, I felt like I was blocking my blessings. So all of a sudden I was like, I'm just going to shift my wishing and my manifesting and my co-creating and whatever you call it. Right. I'm like, you yeah. like, whatever. whatever you call it. <laughs> um, and, you know, I'm going to focus it on, on our, the land that we live on, which are very, conscious of of wanting to heal after 
you know, like a, a good hundred years of conventional farming and which is very extractive and not really pouring life into, right? Like <laughs> the way that we think we should. Um, and I was like, okay, so let's, let's just focus on that. So I started picturing more trees. I was like, I want more, more trees on the yard. And all of a sudden I see like this ad that says, um, I have hundreds of trees, like this fellow farmer, right? Like in the local area. And I'm not going to be able to plant them the way that I wanted to, uh, who wants them. Wow. And I was the first person, like he literally said, when we got to his yard, he said like, there's been 15 or 50 messages after, after you, but we, we got in and we, we got like, I, I bet like close to 200 trees wow. that we've been planting and just, you know, like God is good. Yeah. That feeling of, but right. Like that moment, like that, that, that moment of co-creation happened after I basically said, I am willing to completely let go of my former identity. Yeah. I'm handing it over. I'm surrendering it completely. I, I'm going to stop trying to control people's perception of me, how much money I make. I'm, I'm going to let it all go. Right. And this is usually, usually we're one like really hard decision away from truly opening up and surrendering. Yeah. So you can, within your your current construct, try to surrender and pray. and But usually there's like, you know, the skin in the game, right? Like <laughs> yeah. it, it needs to, you need the to action. put the skin in the game and say like, no, I mean it. Mm -hmm. I mean it, mm -hmm. right? I'm willing to have you step in and completely see my reality shift and change yeah. without having the answers, right? Because this is the thing. We don't know what that next step is. We only know that there is a willingness to take that next step, right? That's yeah. the only thing that we can count on because we can count on ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. I don't, <laughs> I don't know if you saw my face light up when you said you asked yourself that question about being willing because <laughs> so my, uh, my mentor, I don't know if you can see the picture behind me there, but that's um, Bob Proctor. So yeah, um, yeah. I, <laughs> I had the, the blessing of being able to be hands-on mentored by him. I have, wow. um, that's him and his wife there. His wife wrote the foreword for my first book. His son wrote the foreword for my last book. So I have learned so many amazing tools from them in, in terms of like shifting my paradigm. So when you were talking a while ago about asking yourself, are you willing? So Basically, when we want anything, even if it's like, you know, a, a goal that other people would see as ridiculous, yeah. when you start to visualize, and like you said, you were visualizing the the tree, like all of those things, right? So when you start to visualize, um, it's asking yourself, am I willing and am I able to do what it takes for those things? Am, am I Am I willing and am I physically able? Those two questions. And if the answer to those two questions is yes, it immediately brings that fantasy, that vision to a possibility. Yeah. And the yeah. moment that it becomes a possibility, it's like, okay, if you focus on that, you can make that a reality because it's like you have basically said to God, said to the universe, whatever people want to call it, you basically like said, okay, this is, this is my vision. And yes, I'm willing and able to do so. And then you start to attract everything that you need to make that possible. And it requires less physical energy than people realize, but it's really about the focus and the willingness to do so. Absolutely. And I, like what, what I always go by, and I'm curious to see if this is the same for you, but it, it feels so different, you know, like when you are trying to force something versus calling something in, it's like yeah. a profound a different sensation in my body yeah right and and I know that right now in this moment like I've been here before you know what I mean like I'm I'm in my 30s now and and I'm sort of going like wait I know what this stage is this is the the completely the, the breaking down of the old structure yeah right and it's also just like every every seven years or so right yeah. like like my husband always always asked me like you just, you just like you just walked away from from one thing to the next, from a singing career that you have been in and working towards, right? Like for over whatever fifteen years or so, right? Yeah. Of career life and uh, reputation builds and whatever, right? And I just like one day I decided, and <laughs> and um and I remember like so many of my colleagues going like what 
Like you have such beautiful successes and, you know, we will miss your voice. And, and I was like, I'm going to still sing. Yeah. Actually, yesterday, so my girls came home. Uh, they started singing with like, I said it like with multiple voices. What do you call it? Sometimes my, my, my brain blips and it's like, um, anyway, they were singing together with, with like, you know, different voices. Yeah. And, um, right. And they're eight and they're six. And we were just singing acapella and we decided to start like family choir. And um, I asked my, my daughter's like, what should we call it? And my middle daughter was like, we should call it Philip. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, okay, we now have a choir called Philip. <laughs> but you know, I'll, I'll I'll still sing, right? Yeah. Like, and this is the thing: it's like when you when you make those really big shifts and transitions, um, it's not like you just do away with all of that, right? Like, I was able to to take my performance uh, experience and use that in every video that I created in my business, yeah, right. I'm really good at preparing myself. I know how to how to optimize my energy before I go live. Yeah, transferable uh, skills. <laughs> transferable skills left and right, right? Yeah. So, uh, but like what I would love for the listeners just to, to, to ponder, right? It's like, what is that hard decision that you know you need to make? Or maybe don't even know you need to make, right? But like, is there a hard decision somewhere there that you've, you've been postponing because you're afraid of the consequences, Mm -hmm. right? When, when God, when the universe is really constantly reminding you, it's like, what are you not seeing? What are you not willing to see? Yeah. Right. And, and um, yeah. And what if you trusted that the moment you, you allow yourself to flow downstream or with, with the flow, right? Like in the, you're actually meant to go that good things can happen, right? Like that, having having that faith is is what got me from you know living below the poverty line and having seven bucks a month for toiletries all the way to where we are right now where we're literally pondering what we're going to do with you know multiple six figures ready to invest right yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, we're powerful we're powerful concrete if we're willing and we're able yeah. very you know when you spoke to the difference in the feeling of when we're trying to force things versus versus allowing things to happen. That's a a huge part of also, um, you know, of what we often talk about because what we force negates, we're basically pushing it away when we're trying to force something. It's like you're chasing after something and then it's running further away from you, you know, faster. But when you allow things when you let go and let God, when you flow with things, you know, when you're fluid, like the river, that's when things manifest much quicker because you're not trying to like basically, you know, I don't know, beat a rock with a stick. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) Totally. I want it. It's like, no, actually you don't want it. Yeah. Right? It's like you think that that reality that you're calling in doesn't want you. And if you feel rejected by it and there's no opportunities lining up and it's not flowing un- until you realize that this is not what you want. Yeah. Right. And, and you've just been operating and trying to co-create from, from a layer that's probably like duty driven. Yes, right. Absolutely. Or, and, and it's, and it's tricky, right? Because like when, you know, too, like when you've got a good thing going, right. So I'm making millions of dollars a year, blah, blah, blah. There's this sense of how do we sustain this and then grow it? Mm-hmm. Right. That's always the question that you ask yourself as an entrepreneur, but it's not how, how nature actually works. Right. Like when, when we were faced with, do we, want to farm sustainably right that just what it really means is we keep pouring just enough into the ground so that it can sustain the yeah. current output that we want yeah again sort of like we're, we're gonna give this wonderful cash cow just enough self-care so that it can keep performing <laughs> yeah and what we decided is is to go for regenerative so regenerative farming is when you allow nature to also go through the cycles of rest mm. and fellow and um, breakdown. And like what we're doing, like what I'm going to do this afternoon is literally I'm going to mimic nature and create like rotting processes in my garden, which is called mm-hmm. lasagna gardening. Any gardeners listening, <laughs> and like, message me on Instagram, let's talk. 
right? But it's literally you you are playing with decay in order to nourish the soil back to health. Mm. I mean, we don't want to play with decay in our businesses. We all we all just want it to be like shiny in our lives. Yeah. And we only want to talk about the harvests that we have that we were able to call in. Right. And and I had this launch and I had this thing and true regenerative, right, caring and nurturing and bringing things to life. Right. Because that's really what we're doing. We're bringing life back into the soil. It's literally when we see bugs and earthworms, we're like, hello, little creature. <laughs> Welcome to our ecosystem. Like, we love you. Right. Because yeah. that's what the earth needs right now. It needs people who are earth tenders, who are, who are tree planters who right like and are willing to to also play with the elements of decay and rot and 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 understand that that is exactly what's needed to fertilize your next season wow that is a beautiful analogy i love that i love that i actually love that more than the the gym analogy that i've been using where it's like and i'm i'm not a gym person at all but <laughs> when, <laughs> that garden, i got like, like muscles, you know Right. (laughs) But when someone is going to the gym and they're working on building that muscle, whether, you know, you, even if they went to the gym seven days a week, they go today, it's leg day, they go tomorrow, it's core, they go the next day, you know, different parts of the body because they need to let the part that they've worked rest. And it's in the rest phase where the growth is actually happening. So I, lo- I love I love your analogy. I feel like we could like sit and talk for hours. <laughs> for sure. Uh, <laughs> we definitely could. <laughs> I'm actually, honestly, I feel like the last, I don't know, I've been so blessed that the last few months, so I've been recording this podcast for almost five years now, but the last six months or so, it's almost like every guest that I have, I'm like, I need to have you back on for a part two. Like the conversations yeah. have been so fruitful and so fulfilling that it's like, okay, we need more of this. <laughs> yeah. Well, anytime you just message me. <laughs> Absolutely. So, okay. Before, before we go, you know, to the final segment and stuff, I love if, if you could share with the listeners how you transitioned from, you know, financially struggling as an opera singer performing, you know, at the Vatican in Europe to yeah. multiple seven figure business owner working on a farm in Canada on 160 acres. <laughs> yeah. But well, I mean, the truly the simple, simple answer is, is, is like willingness and being able, you know, like that would be honestly my answer because what we started doing so we uh started doing a lot of meditations created by dr joe dispenza i don't know if you're familiar i probably. love dr joe dispenza love dr. Joe. <laughs> um and it was interesting you know because we were friends with this um chinese medicine couple and they were like we just bought a stack of these books and we're giving them to all our friends <laughs> So, you know, we start doing this meditation and all of a sudden, like everything starts to shift. We become more willing. We become more able. There's just this opening happening. And, um, and, and the other thing that I started doing, I started literally creating space in my life for the new chapter to come in. So I love like physically decluttering my house Yes, and doing feng shui, right? So like energy flow and energy sort of flow science. So I did that. So I literally started physically creating space, mentally creating space, um, knowing that I was ready. I was ready for that seed to be planted and for it to start flourishing. I took a business course, which quite frankly, you know, I paid off five bucks an hour. Yeah. <laughs> like, $3,000 business course, you know, and, and started implementing. And um, I I had a, a stretch there for a few years where I was a conversion copywriter. I was like, I wasn't sure how I wanted to position myself. But I still don't honestly know how to position myself. I think, you know, we're such multidimensional human beings, um, mm-hmm. right? Am I a business mentor? Am I am I more of a life coach? I don't know. Like, you know. You could be that, both. <laughs> yeah, right? Um, I'm a very, like, multi-hyphenate type of person. Um so I, I started just like offering value. I started posting in Facebook groups. And as I was learning about copywriting, I basically took something that I learned and then I posted about it. I was like presenting it in my own way, with my own thoughts, with my own examples. And right. And that's how I learned. So while I was educating myself on amazing, you know, full body chills, copywriting and messaging, 
I posted about it and, and showcased basically my journey. And so people started to find me and wanted to work with me. And then from, from there, like within a few months, I was working with a list, uh, like online business celebrities. Yeah. Cause they, they loved what I was doing and how I was writing. And I was really writing from that, from the perspective of an opera singer. It's like, how can we get people to like cry or laugh or like yeah. emotion? emotion? Yeah. Um, so that again, like skills transfers galore. Right. And, um, and I've always like really relied on network. So I've made millions of dollars with like a, a little small Facebook group, um, for the longest time, I had about a thousand followers on Instagram. I think now I'm more like close to 4,000. It's not my forte to grow like a massive audience. If you have any tips, let me know. <laughs> I'm pretty much a disaster at it. <laughs> but I'm very, very good at, at, at networking and relationship building. And that's also how I teach my clients. And um, so, right, like people are very relationship focused and to do really well in my programs. And yeah. yeah and, and so, you know, and then I also have, it's this is very funny. So I, at one point I, um, I started reading erotic novels because I was like, you know, pandemic, yeah. <laughs> like disaster flight. And I was like, I will not be that mom that like doesn't want to have sex anymore. Just, just like dried up and shriveled up. Shriveled. <laughs> I watch, like, I'll be like a passive suicidal disaster while I'm, Chopping veggies in the kitchen, but I will I will not disconnect from from my like sexual and sensual sides. Yeah. So um I started reading erotic novels and then you know, as I was sharing that journey and just like my openness around like exploring what you actually love and what turns you on and how awesome Kindle is, because you can just type in what you love and <laughs> get books give you that it's awesome right <laughs> as you go you discover more about yourself it's been it's been great um one one of my students actually um decided that she was super kinky and decided to completely rearrange her life and it's currently maybe tied up literally. <laughs> kind of adventure right so sometimes like the outcomes I have tons of like success stories and all those things like financially but you know I you know you probably have the same with your people it's like it's far more than than just like this one yeah. like, transformation right that absolutely help people unleash within themselves so absolutely yeah. um there's a couple of things that you said there that I wanted to highlight I guess for one, we'll start with Dr. Joe Dispenza. For those who are listening, go and look him up. He is the perfect combination of mixing science and spirituality because, you know, the scientific world had a very hard time with anything spiritual because it's not tangible or they can't prove or facts. But Joe Dispenza was able to, I guess, inject spirituality into the science world and make it acceptable, like showing proof of things. Yeah, or just show that what we consider spiritual actually has can be scientifically backed. Yes. You know, yeah. By, yeah. Yes, absolutely. I love I've 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 read his uh, books. I've listened to all his interviews. I I love him. <laughs> There's another uh, thing that you you spoke about that I wanted to highlight, and now my my brain is like, oh, there was so much. <laughs> oh, I can't remember which one. <laughs> okay, well, I can't remember right now. I'm I'm sure it'll come to me later. And I'm gonna be like, darn it. I think it was when you were talking about. Oh yes, just adding value on yeah, on social yeah. when you when you learn something and then you teach it like the greatest way to show that you understand something that you've learned is to teach it to someone else so i love how you said you took everything and then you know you you were sharing it on social i'm one of those people that i will you know read a ton of books and listen to podcasts and go to yeah. all these seminars and then i come home and i'm trying to explain it to everybody and they're looking at me like okay <laughs> okay <laughs> You but I just want to show it. Like, like, I'm just trying to teach them this great information. <laughs> so yeah. I, I love that you were able to take what you were learning and, um, you know, create more knowledge and information for other people. And I think some people assume if you're trying to grow a business or utilize social media, because I see it done incorrectly all the time, people are just throwing up post and promoting their product or service and people truly don't care like they don't care about those they want to know how it can help them what can it do for them how can it transform educate or inspire them 
yeah, so I'm I'm pretty much the same on my social as well, where like Instagram, I'll share all of these tips and you know, I just got a little more comfortable with video where I'm Yay. instead of, you know, because <laughs> I'm an introvert. So instead of just having like the text, I'm actually, you know, sharing that stuff and it's not constantly trying to get transactions out of people. I find that when you build the relationships, the transactions come, you know, people start to refer you or they see that you're providing value out there. You genuinely care about, you know, helping and um, being of service. If we ever do do a part two, I would love to chat with you about like, what if you feel you don't have the capacity to to keep building relationships and sustaining relationships. Mm. Cause that's something that I'm very introverted as well. And I yeah. don't do well, well with a high volume of communication. Yeah. A lot of people wanting things for me. Yes. So for me, the, the challenge has been like, can I, can I build the kind of friendships that if I fall out of touch for a few months, it's okay. Yeah. I'll almost like set that expectation and understand that. No, I'm not that kind of person who, effortlessly, you know, communicates with everyone all of the time. Quite frankly, probably my husband is the only one who I can communicate with where it doesn't cost me like, you know, <laughs> yeah. social. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> because I'm married to him and I spend every day, like we're like connected at the hip. Like, honestly, like, we do everything together. We're going to go out today and garden and then we're going to cook together. And I love that. We're trying to get the most out of our life, I guess. So we're, we have a 26, sometimes 27 year age gap. So we just wow. uh, trying to get like, you know, <laughs> 65 years out of whatever time we have together. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I, I love that. And you know what? I think that I, I wish more um, successful business owners talked about that, especially with being introverted. Um, I think at the beginning of the pandemic, I read, I think it's Susan Cain's book, um, Quiet, yeah. that actually helped me to accept being an introvert because I used to see it as such a, um, you know, a crutch or a blockage and being able to now be comfortable being an introvert and understand Okay, there's nothing wrong with me, <laughs> you know, and I can still operate my business in this space. And the good friendships that I do have and friendships that I've had since I was in grade school and I'm now in my 40s yeah. are with people who understand, don't call me every day, <laughs> don't text me every 10 minutes. We can see each other every couple of months, couple of weeks and pick up where we left off and we are great. There's no hard feelings. There's no, you know, oh, feeling like you don't care about me. Like those are the friendships that I value the most. And I have many of those friendships, which I'm so blessed and grateful for. Um, so yeah, I would definitely, definitely love to have you back on and for us to to dig into that. Cause I think that's, I think that is a much needed conversation for sure, because I know that there are people that feel like they're alone and where they're like, oh, I can't do this in my business. Can I'm an introvert or, or I need to push through and just ignore who I really am if I want to be successful. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and that's not how it has to function or how yeah. it's, no, for absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. I uh, the 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 pandemic has allowed me to honor that space as a business owner because when everything shut down it was like it was like okay, clean slate. <laughs> I can operate how I want to operate right now. Um, you know, I don't have to go out to a networking event every other night and drain my social battery. I don't have to do this. I don't have to do that. And when things started to open back up, I was like, no thank you. Because I'm still surviving. Well, yeah. Exactly. Right. Like then you know, oh wait, like my life's actually really good when I just pick and choose very, yes. very yeah. 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 Well, we'll we'll definitely have another conversation about that. I'm I'm excited. Okay. So before we go to the rapid fire, I would love if you could tell the listeners where they could stay connected with you online, where they can learn more from you and about you. Yeah. So come find me on Instagram. I would say that's a really great place to start. So Meryl Creeksman. I post a whole bunch on my account, like really, really valuable content. It's basically like all my thought leadership and stuff just just lives there for you to dig into and and, and enjoy. Uh, and then from my link tree, you can join my Facebook group. You can join my email list. My email list is almost like you think I'm transparent on social media. Like try my email list. Yeah. Right? That's <laughs> some of the most uh, personal 
yeah, like I don't want to say just struggles, but like internal things that I move through or that move me, right? Mm-hmm. Like book recommendations and movie recommendations and all that stuff. So from there, you can just pick and choose wherever you want to stay connected with me. I love it when I get messages on Instagram from people that hear me on podcasts or panels or summits. Uh, come say hi, come introduce yourself. If you have a question, you're so welcome to just pop in and connect. Awesome. 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 I will definitely have all of your links in the detailed section below so they can just click and connect with you directly. They don't have to search too far. Awesome. Wonderful. For the final segment, it's rapid fire. Uh, you can answer one word or one sentence. Um, and if you're, you know, a bit of a rule breaker like me and rules make you claustrophobic, mm-hmm. you are more than welcome to expand. <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Name a book that has changed or greatly impacted your life. Well, like we already said, like, you know, Joe Dispenza's um, Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself, I think is the perfect one to mention here. Love it. Okay. What new belief, behavior, or habit has improved your life in the last five years? Reading erotic novels every day. Love it. Okay. How has motherhood changed you? Completely, irrevocably. Such a great question. (laughs) Well, I just you know, I wasn't willing to be a financial disaster in front of my children. Mm. So I got my shit together is how it changed me. Love it. (laughs) Love it. (laughs) What's one thing that people often get wrong about you? Well, I think people know me from uh, my um, core question that I always put forward, which is like, what if you had 10 times the courage you really feel you have right now? Like, what would you do? What would you say? What would you post? Who would you connect with? Who would you put yourself forward to but actually like in my family there's there's a lot of like anxiety disorders diagnosed including myself I'm not diagnosed but I've definitely had so many like even right now my heart rate is elevated Mm -hmm. it's just you know we struggle with anxiety a lot um and so people think that I was just born this way but actually I've I've had to hone being courageous over and over and over again. And I saw my mom do it and I saw my siblings do it. Right. When you're so scared, like, like one of my siblings, he doesn't even dare to go into public transport. He literally biked over, I think like, let's say trying to, to do the translation. It's like 50 kilometers. So it's like, I don't know, whatever, how many miles that is to visit my parents that he hadn't seen over a year because he doesn't dare to be in a bus or a train. Yeah. Right. It just triggers his his anxiety. Yeah. Like when you see your siblings go through that and you see your mom go through that and you have episodes yourself, like courage is the only answer. Right. And you learn to like hone it until it's this this tool that you just grab every morning, right? And you you help yourself like work through your day. Yeah. Um so yeah, I would love for people to to understand that about me a little bit more. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. Again, totally resonate with everything you just said. <laughs> Coming from a family of people with all kinds of diagnosis from anxiety to schizophrenia, ADHD, OCD, like, yeah, like I saw my, my siblings go through psychoses, right? Like I um I had anorexia, which is basically a psychosis as well, right? Mm-hmm. Like you have a completely different perception from what is actually happening, right? And what your body actually looks like. Yeah. That gives you, and I know, I know you you were you you know this, right? Like it gives you a different perception of your life, what to lean on versus what not to lean on how you relate to other people, a deeper understanding of, yeah, maybe she's not reaching out to me because she just really needs to go inward or because this person needs to heal or because they've just gone through grief. Or I think it just makes you a more compassionate person. Yes, absolutely. I agree with that a thousand percent. Um, Yeah. As you were talking, I was going to say, it makes you a more compassionate person than you said it. (laughs) 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 I mean, (laughs) I was, um, I was diagnosed with anxiety um, after I had my son. So it's just over 17 years ago. And, you know, I had postpartum depression with all three kids. And, you know, I've got kids like diagnosed with ADD and ADHD and anxiety and the whole nine yards. And it's like, 
forcing me to be more compassionate when other people behave a certain way or act a certain way or react a certain way. Instead of personalizing it, it is like, okay, what is that person dealing with? What's happening within them? Why they need to react that way? And I think, you know, I don't want to say that it's, you know, a good thing to have these things, but at the same time, being able to find the positive within it, how you can utilize that to be a better human being in general. Yeah. 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 The way that I see it. So I was, uh, I was planting um, lupins the other day, which is like these beautiful torch, like flowers, gorgeous. And I grow them from seed. I go around like as a way to connect, I go, go around to the gardens of my, of my neighbors And I gather seeds with my children in the fall so that we have seeds for all kinds of flowers that we have never planted like the next spring, just a fun connection, like way to connect with people around you. But lupin seeds, you need to take sandpaper, you need to actually rough up and open up the seed. If you just plant it, it won't grow, it will just rot on the earth. But if you you open it up, then it has a chance to to come out and and start growing. And that's really, I feel what, what, anxiety and I mean like in hindsight multiply multiple postpartum like psych near psychosis psychosis like moments you know it just it forces me to be humble to be on my knees to be open to receive right so as it just creates a, a different kind of spiritual experience that has broken me open in the past yeah. over and over again yeah, yeah. wow Okay. When and where are you the happiest? Oh, uh, in what we call our far garden. So we have a kitchen garden, which is close to the house. Then we have a far garden, which is uh, designed around the concepts of permaculture, which is really how indigenous peoples have have gardened. And um, it has all kinds of layers and everything connects with each other and supports each other. And there's like berries and there's like, right, there's all kinds of things that I just love. I love, love spending time there with the kids. We were there yesterday all evening. We made a fire. We we ate there. We just hung out there. It's way too much work for two people. <laughs> <laughs> now we're constantly picking weeds, and now we're gonna layer everything so that <laughs> the soil can <laughs> for a year. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> okay. Um. Last but not least, what's the best advice you've ever received? You know, it actually links back to our panel conversation. After the birth of Isa during the pandemic, and my husband was basically panic planting entire like world out there because it was like, what if supply chains break down? <laughs> we need our own food supply, right? So he's like, or like he was so busy there and making his contribution there. But I was like, I was alone a lot and, and not in a good place, and I was not sleeping. And so I started saying to my mom, like, I think I have I have burned out, like I've, I'm burning out. And she said don't try and diagnose it. You're just really rightfully tired. That's mm-hmm. that's different, right? So that doesn't mean that you can't be really, really tired, but still have a creative spark, right? And still have moments of absolute genius and right. You're not burning out. You're just rightfully really tired, <laughs> right? It's a lot. Yeah. So, so just like, you know, instead of choosing this way of, of labeling it and just say like take it take it for what it is every day and and work with what you have right yeah. it really helped me yeah just like move through like a really hard season wow i i love that advice and i'm going to take that advice for myself right now you know despite having an extensive self care routine and feeling like i'm no longer in a place of uh surviving but thriving i am rightfully tired right now Like, you know, we're, we're moving, I'm about to be a grandmother, you know, all the kids have individual needs as these adults. It's, it's a lot. Yeah. (laughs) lot. Especially this generation, right? Because these are, these are all kids that are coming off age between basically the pandemic, which completely shifted the work, like the marketplace and rise of AI. It's like, yeah. Who are they supposed to be? What career should they choose? Should they just like wait it out a bit? Like, you know, kids, yeah. kids have questions, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Well, honestly, Mara, we definitely have to do a part two because I'm like, you know, 
we've gone over time, but I want more time. <laughs> like I'm, I'm enjoying this conversation very much. So, so we'll definitely have to have uh, a part two. Um, yeah. I know that the listeners will definitely appreciate everything that you've shared today. So thank you for your time, your energy, your wisdom, your humility, all of it. Just thank you. Thank you for having me and being such a wonderful host. Thank you. And to all of you healers out there, we would love to hear what resonated with you. Feel free to leave us a review on Apple podcast and let us know what touched you from Meryl's story, what gem she left you with, what aha moments you had. We love to hear your feedback. And I want to thank each and every one of you that continues to listen each week to help the show rank globally in the top 1.5% of most popular shows. That's out of over 3 million podcasts out there, which blows my mind thinking that I'm just in my little introverted corner of the world. (laughs) So thank you all. (laughs) Right. I'm going to challenge you, you know, screenshot this week's episode and you can tag Meryl at Meryl Kriegman. So that's M E R. E-L-K-R-I-E-G-S-M-A-N or you can tag myself at The Real McKinney Smith. A healthy community is a healing community and a healing community is full of hope because it has seen its own people weather, survive, and thrive. So let's continue to heal her.